In the beginning, I'd like to thank ASOR for its support to the protection of Libyan cultural heritage, and this conference is an example of this support. And I'd like to thank Dr. Mohammed Mraja and the engineer Saad al Jrusi, who supervised the work of this group. Today, we're going to talk about the interactions of Libyans with their cultural heritage, negative or positive which wasn't something special to only Libyans. Many countries who have cultural heritage sites and ruins that have been through the same things. And if we were to talk about the positive interactions, which are based on how people see the cultural heritage as a part of their identity and history. This positive perception could also be found in Libya and among other countries especially in modern societies where science and culture has flourished, along with the development of archaeology, increase of excavations, and the discoveries of monuments. On the other side, the negative interaction is much older, and it reflects the culture of a society that is closer to ignorance, and Libya was like that. During the Ottoman and Italian rule, where the only accessible education was religious, and not even in all over Libya. Due to the poor economical situation, people had to find a way to live, and didn't care for their wounds, they didn't even understand what they were. We've used the chronological order of information in our presentation today. Starting from the Ottoman control in Libya from 1551 to the present era, with a focus on the Karamanli period from 1711 to 1835, where famous travelers have visited Libya and wrote about it. Their writings are one of the most important of our sources, and based on what the travelers mentioned and described, about the interactions of the Libyans with the antiquities and archaeological sites. An important description was what the traveler Al Abdali, who wrote about the Libyan antiquities, has described of the city of Liptis Magna and the city of Tripoli, where the still standing Ark of Marcus Aurelius that he has described as well. He described Liptis Magna where it saw the use of marble and described a statue of a woman on the road that was untouched nor destroyed. And that's a positive point from that time. Libyans have interacted with antiquities and ruins from the beginning of their lives and have also made use of them. For example, the Ark of Marcus Aurelius, which was built around 163 AD. It didn't get destructed, and people used it in many different ways. They didn't look at it as something unique and of a value, but they just made use of it. And as Thule mentions that the Ark was forbidding to him, even though it was used, and he also complained of the dirtiness that is surrounding it. Second point that is worth noting is that Libyans have used burial sites or tombs as a place to live in, especially in Cyrenaica, where the cave-like burial sites were occupied in war times and also until recent times. Libyans have used some of the unexcavated archaeological sites for agriculture and as a farming land, like Apollo area in Cyrene. Pictures from the 1860 and 1895. These pictures from Smith Bookchur shows us the use of tombs and burial sites for housing and as a shelter for domestic animals 
in the archaeological site in Cyrene. This caused an intended damage to the site and its antiquities. The decorations and drawings in these caves are lost due to the use of the place. Many historical items have been thrown away or reused in some cases. And some of these items were given to children to play with and to throw at each other. Another picture showing the reuse of archaeological sites due to the poverty and misery and people not understanding these ruins. This has caused an intentional damage, but they made use of what was there in front of them. One of the reasons behind the previous negative points is the perception of the antiquities by Libyans. They're perceived with ignorance and with a shallow understanding which they've connected with the wrongful religious interpretations. For instance, they saw them as statues that were worshipped by long-gone ancient nations, or people who were frozen and turned to statues by God as a punishment for their wrongdoings. The city of Garza, for example, was called the city of the cursed. We're talking about Yusuf Basha al-Karamanli, who sent the traveler William Smith to the city to see is this really the city of the cursed? And when he arrived at the city, he noticed that these sculptures might date back to the Roman era and they were influenced by local style. In Liptis Magna, the locals has lived near the ancient city and its ruins, part of which was buried, but its remains are still visible, and some of the columns are still there. These columns were used by people according to their needs. They used marble columns and olive presses. The Ottoman Empire at the time prohibited their use or seizure by locals, but then they sold them in the name of preserving antiquities. A lot of these columns has been given off by the Qaramanli and were transported by travelers to France and Britain. In the early period, let's talk about how Libyans dealt with the statues that were discovered by accident. For example, a statue was discovered in the city of Benghazi in 1672 by some of the locals. It was completely destroyed in another statue in 1693. It was preserved because the owner of the house that was a judge ordered that it not be smashed and was sent to Tripoli, which later on arrived to France. These are examples where people see them as accursed statues. We can benefit from what the travelers have mentioned and described of Libya. We have the Italian traveler Civelli, 1812, and Paolo de la Scilla, 1817, who mentioned and described the city of Benghazi and talked about almost the same stories on how the residents were looking for valuable coins that would appear or wash off on the beach and then sell them to foreigners without knowing the real value. The traveler Henry Smith talks about something that has happened in the same period. It tells us about a group of Libyans that have found a treasure of gold and silver coins near the city of Msalata and then took them to Tripoli where they were melted and completely transformed into raw material. Same traveler used Libyan workers in Liptis to get 40 columns and transport them to Britain. So these were the impressions or descriptions of some of the travelers on Libyans. In 
we have the travelers Bici and Pacho around the same period. Bici describes how the residents of Benghazi have used ancient stones to rebuild their homes. These stones were cut down and reused. And also described the statues in Cyrene that were without heads and some of them were completely destroyed. In the travel diaries of some of the travelers and consuls, we can find the names of some Libyans who were excavating for antiquities. Muhammad al-Araj and Muhammad al-Antiko, they worked during the same period in which Berville was working, the French consul in 1848. Even before that, there were some things that they've given or sold to him. In light of these negative things, how did the Ottoman Empire deal with the antiquity state in the region, whether the Karamanli or the Ottomans? At first, they did not understand the value of antiquities, so they gave them as gifts and allowed the consuls to excavate. But later on, they took care of antiquities and guarded them but they were still selling the antiquities and columns to citizens. We have another example, Smith and Borcher in 1860. They've carried excavation work in Cyrene and used a large number of Libyan workers. The work of Libyans and their interest can be considered as some sort of awareness of the importance of the cultural heritage, its value, and how much they cared to learn to excavate. For example, we have Dennis. He taught Libyans how to excavate in Tokra. He got us several valuable antiques, which he bought from the locals for a cheap price due to their ignorance of their value. In the first scientific excavations in Cyrene, carried by the American Nord, 1911, he also used local labor. The locals have obtained about 750 terracotta statues, which they sold to him later on. Also, the locals during that period in Cyrene had nothing to do with Deco's killing. His killing had nothing to do with antiquities, rather it was politically motivated. When Libya fell under the Italian occupation from 1911 to 1943, of course they were the ones who took over the antiquities and they've made or found the antiquities department. They've created special laws for antiquities in 1914. They took care of organizing the archaeological work through their management. And they've also used the locals in excavation work. As we can see in the pictures now. In Cyrene or in Liptis Magna or in all the other areas where they've worked at. Sometimes it was forced and sometimes it was paid labor. They've used the locals in restoration works later on, where a lot of workers have learned from them in the late 30s, such as Ibrahim Kamuka from Sabrata and others. In other words, the Libyans learned the importance of antiquities from this point, which is a positive thing. Under the Italian rule, Libyans were afraid of doing any harm or damage to the antiquities, because there was an administration and there were penalties. Some of the positive interactions with antiquities is the interest the Libyan state showed in this sector after its independence in 1951. The establishment of a special administration for antiquities 
and a law for antiquities in 1953, organizing the process of seeking help from foreigners. There are many Libyans who worked in the administration in restoration work and excavations and others. This is a very important positive stage. What made a stronger positive interaction with antiquities is the establishment of a special department for archaeology in the Libyan University. It has been teaching archaeology since 1970 and the establishment of other departments now in most Libyan universities. About more than a thousand graduates from these departments now since 1974 and they're working in the Libyan Department of Antiquities. The Libyan Society pushing their children into learning the science and to lead the Antiquities Department and the protection of cultural heritage. One of the positive things or actions that we can refer to is that now Libyans are leading in the work of restoration, management, and protection of archaeological sites, and also in the excavations, maintenance, and work with foreign missions. After February 2011, there were many problems happening to the cultural heritage due to the revolution and civil unrest, the lack of security, the failure to enforce the law in many cases, which led to a lot of abuses, the bulldozing of sites, theft, lack of protection, tampering with the archaeological sites, construction work, and many more problems. Despite that, there were some citizens who took it upon themselves to protect the sites and the museums. The complete destruction and erosion of archaeological sites in the absence of law. Also in Cyrene in 2016, a lot of tombs and burial sites were subject to destruction. Destruction of sites in Benghazi. Also in the area of Massa, a whole burial site has been completely removed. Look at the before and after pictures. All of these are negative factors. Uncontrolled animal grazing in the absence of law enforcement and other things. For instance, these are 129 rock drawings in a cacos that were vandalized on purpose by a specialized person, a travel guide. This vandalism is happening every day and there is no law enforcement to stop it. Many different archaeological sites are being vandalized. Illegal excavations, which resulted in many items being lost or subject to smuggling outside of the country. As you can see, items were smuggled outside of the country due to the lack of law enforcement and custom police. For example, this is Benghazi's treasure. In 2013, about a thousand pieces were stolen. That's a negative interaction. Theft of museums, like Susa and Bani Walid museums and others. Sadly, 
what was stolen from the museums and other places is being publicly sold online now, with no one to stop them. Also, the religious extremism, like what happened in Lathron Church, the tombs were completely destroyed in 2013. Then in Darna and Zuela, tombs were completely destroyed. Also, war has negatively affected and damaged some of the archaeological sites, like what happened to Sabratha's theater and the tomb of Sophit in the city of Qala. The increase in negative interactions and abuses to antiquities since 2011 has led the UNESCO to put Libyan sites in the endangered cultural heritage list in 2016. While we've talked about the negative aspects and the interactions, there are still some positive things that we can talk about. There are people who hand the antiquities and items they find or buy sometimes to the authorities. For example, Al Bijou, who used to work in the Department of Antiquities. He has handed around 2,050 pieces, which he have found and even bought from small children in Cyrene. These are recent examples. Another person is Sa'ad Abu Halfain, who handed more than a hundred pieces. He paid a very large amount of money to get them from antiquities thieves. All of these are positive factors and interactions. There are people who are keen on protecting their cultural heritage. They've received some rewards for their efforts, as there are some people who try to steal and damage the cultural heritage. In 2018, there was an exhibition for the received and retrieved artifacts, and another one to come in Tripoli. That's something positive despite the current situation. In conclusion, how do we stop the negative interactions with antiquities and how do we reduce it? For example, we need to manage antiquities or cultural heritage in a correct scientific manner, supported by the Libyan state and the local community and internationally, including the protection and support of restoration of museums and others. Also spreading archaeological awareness and making antiquities as part of the Libyan identity. By clearing misconceptions about antiquities like that they are the legacy of colonialism and have nothing to do with Libyans. And also letting go religious interpretations and fallacies that led to the destruction of antiquities, especially tombs and others including antiquities and how people could benefit of them in school curriculums and raising awareness among the young generations. The activation of the role of civil society and institutions in the awareness process, such as the suitcase museum project and others, as well as the establishment of museums and training police caterers to protect cultural heritage from theft and smuggling. These are all positive factors that must be taken into steps by the state in order to prevent negative interaction with the antiquities. Thank you.